Now, of course, when we're caught in conditioning, when we're when we feel contracted and we start to suffer, we naturally don't want to stay in that state. And one of the things that makes this even more challenging is part, a lot of the spiritual tools or teachings are, that are really meant to get you to let go, to disidentify with the egoic construct. A lot of those teachings that get, try to get you to do that are actually very dualistic teachings. They'll say, well, this is, you, you look at things and you, you see if they're true or real or unreal, and you're kind of classifying your experience as either real or unreal, or this is me or this is not me. And you're, you're going, you're kind of sifting through experience and utilizing the power of discrimination, right? And it's a very powerful tool to have in your life and certainly in your spiritual life, the power of discrimination to see, to discriminate between what's true and not true. And so these are very powerful kind of tools or very powerful teachings to discriminate between the real and the unreal because as you deeply see that what we're holding on to and the whole wheel of conditioning really is based upon in unreality. It's kind of a, a fundamental kind of confusion when you get right down to the bottom of it. Well, those are the teachings that are used. But then to, to really take the next step into a, a deeper state of maturity, if you've had some deep spiritual shift, a kind of awakening out of the whole egoic mindset, you realize that that's not, you, not who you are. Then, however, the, the, uh, the, the residual sort of effect of that teaching is that there's part of your human experience that you've labeled as unreal or untrue as a means to wake up. But once you really wake up, it doesn't really, at some point, it doesn't serve to keep viewing your experience through that lens, through that sort of dualistic lens. At some point, we have to let our maturity gr grow, and as it does, either suddenly or at any point, you realize that your whole humanity, as, as clear and as flawed as it may be, that your, your entire humanity is also an expression of true nature, of Buddha nature, of nirvana, right? In the relative world, you know, everything has its limitation. Uh, your, <clears throat> your relative human, human existence, even if you're not solely identified with your body or mind, still there is a body, there is a mind, and that body is going through life and having experiences and, and all of it. That only when we can see that that whole human element, as I said, with its strength and its strengths and its weaknesses, is also a manifestation of true nature. If we really see that, it removes a tremendous amount of the conflict in it a tremendous amount of the underlying conflict, or, and certainly the residual conflict of, um, you know, we have some sort of, like I said, some sort of awakening experience, and there's your true being, and then there's the parts that you deem not to be true. So the reason that's this is hard to, to describe is because we don't really have the appropriate word in our, in our, in language, of something that that conveys the sense that reality can show up as enlightened or unenlightened. Reality can show up as true or untrue. Reality can show up as clear or unclear. It just so happens that baked into the nature of reality, the reality of consciousness, is that there will there will always be an inclination towards a more unified state. So our inclination will be, once we mature enough, will be towards truth, will be towards, towards reality. 
But that doesn't mean that the that unreality is, you know, fu- made or comes from some other fundamental dimension that's that's separated from true nature. As I said, true nature, or the nature of reality, or if we just talk about consciousness, you all know that your consciousness can manifest as a kind of clear consciousness, a loving consciousness, peaceful, at ease, um, a kind of causeless joy. But the exact same consciousness can manifest tremendous pain and sorrow and depression and conflict. Right? It's the same consciousness. It has the potential to be experienced in this extraordinarily um, wide and vivid way. So perhaps if you just look at it as, as, as your own consciousness, you see that your consciousness can manifest in many different ways. But it's all the same consciousness. So as our, re, as our insight deepens, we, we stop associating reality simply with the positive aspects of consciousness. We see that consciousness in, a, in and of itself is just a... It's just sort of a, a, a realm of potentiality. It has the potential to have wonderful, fantastic, ecstatic experiences and absolutely horrendous, difficult, challenging experiences. Same consciousness, right? So I don't think that that's... I hope that that part's not so difficult to understand how the same consciousness can have this wide variety of experiences unfolding within it. Um, but to really get that on an experiential level is something, you know, quite different. It's a, it's a, deeper, it's a deeper step. And one of, the, one of the hallmarks of really deeply understanding, not just in your mind, but in your heart and your whole being, one of the hallmarks of deeply understanding this is that you stop being in opposition to your humanity. You, you, you start to simply have a much more benevolent or compassionate way of viewing and experiencing your humanness. That can even include your, of course, your strengths, your weaknesses, um, those aspects of your being that we could say are true and real and those that are sort of imagined and conditioned and illusory. But you stop fundamentally judging it. You can still use discrimination, what's true and not true. Right? You can still use your discrimination, but the difference is when you see the, un- the underlying unity of all things and of all states, I could say, all states of consciousness, when you see that underlying unity, you stop judging certain states of consciousness as sort of wrong, as sort of bad. And when you're no longer judging them, Of course, they can still be difficult, so of course you inherently don't want to dwell in painful, conflicted states of consciousness. But when you really see that it's all consciousness, as I say, one of the signs or or hallmarks that you know you've really seen this is you start to have a much more benevolent, a kind, um, compassionate, uh, way of being with even the negative aspects of your being. In other words, you're not trying to push them away. You're not trying to necessarily escape from them. You, you will feel a natural desire to, to find some clarity in them, to bring all aspects of conscious experience into alignment, into... Uh, this, the realized state, you could say. But this is a different way of relating. There's a way that you relate with your experience where you're trying to simply not have certain experiences or eliminate certain responses. And another, a whole different way of 
relating to those very experiences are you're actually instead endeavoring to, you're, you're embracing them, not necessarily that you're identifying with them, that you're embracing them and endeavoring to bring them into a more realized state, bring them into alignment with their own, with their own truth, with their own, with, with true nature. Right? When all of us is sort of in alignment with true nature, that we feel very lined up. Everything is sort of lined up. That's not, um, that consciousness is then not in conflict. But we don't really get all of the aspects of our being to, to line up, to come into accord with, with true nature by judging or even trying to escape certain aspects of your being because you can't bring something in your experience into accord with true nature that you're simultaneously trying to get away from right you can't push something away and bring it and bring it very close into the true nature at the same time 